Welcome everyone uh, to the third event in this new seminar series on Muslim thought in South Asia, jointly hosted by the Center of South Asia Studies and the Center of Islamic Studies here at the University of Cambridge. Um, my name is Toshif Kara, and a special thanks to the Center of South Asia Studies for cross-listing this event with their weekly seminar. Um, so this seminar series brings together emerging and established scholars from various disciplinary backgrounds to discuss ideas and Islam within and sometimes even beyond the subcontinent, both past and present. Uh, the seminar series runs on alternate Tuesdays during term time at 5 p.m. And the next event will take place on the 8th of June when Shayan Rajani from LUMS will present on conceptions of time and the individual in the Mughal world. Um, before I introduce uh, today's speaker, just a few uh, housekeeping notes. Uh, and I will speak for around 35 minutes, during which I ask that you please keep yourselves muted. Um, after the presentation, we will have plenty of time for questions and discussions, uh, which you can ask by using the raise hand function. Uh, the presentation itself will be recorded, but the discussion portion will not. And before I introduce our speaker, I just wanted to pass it over to um, Sujit Siva Sundaram, who is the director of the Center for South Asia Studies to say a few words about the center. Um, thanks so much, Tashif, and um, welcome everyone on behalf of the Center of South Asian Studies as well. And Tashif has just asked me to say a little bit about the center because, of course, uh, this is a cross-listed event uh, with the Center of Islamic Studies um, as well. So the center in normal times is a vibrant hub for work on South and Southeast Asia across the disciplines in the humanities and social sciences here at the University of Cambridge. It has a busy MPhil program. Uh, drawing students from around the world and especially interestingly it draws students of course from Pakistan, from Bangladesh, from Sri Lanka and from India. So it really allows a series of conversations to happen across boundaries uh, here uh, in, in the UK um, for instance. And it's very good to see this developing relationship then between the Centre of South Asian Studies and the Centre of Islamic Studies. Uh, which in some ways is embodied in Taushif, uh, Kara, uh, and also Vivek uh, Gupta, who are the two research associates um, who uh, were recently appointed at the Center of Islamic Studies um, and who are also associated uh, with the Center of South Asian Studies. And um, Taushif's um, program, of course, crosses across the two centers um, uh, on Muslim thought uh, in particular. So really, we're delighted to host this event, and we're very much looking forward uh, to Navida Khan's uh, lecture uh, on what is Bangladesh. So over to Tashif to introduce uh, the speaker. Thank you uh, very much, Sujit. So uh, with that, is, it is a privilege and an honor to welcome uh, Navida Khan to Cambridge today, albeit uh, virtually. Um, Khan is an associate professor of anthropology at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore. Uh, her research interests are broad and varied, uh, ranging from a focus on Islam and the everyday in Pakistan, to climate change and riverine societies in Bangladesh, to German idealism and philosophy. Uh, but throughout her work, Khan offers a striking and refreshing engagement with multiple intellectual historical traditions, often simultaneously uh, by tracking their contemporary invocations and remaking. Her early research uh, on Pakistan led to the publication of Muslim Becoming, Aspiration and Skepticism in Pakistan, published in 2012 with Duke University Press, uh, which won the American Institute of Pakistan Studies Book Prize. Uh, and rather than yet again describing Pakistan as a lack or a failure, Khan's book foregrounds the crucial importance of disputation and debate to everyday life. Uh, forthcoming is a set of manuscripts, uh, the first of which is titled uh, Accounting for an Uncertain Future, the Climate Regime in the Global South, from which we will hear a little bit today. And the second forthcoming title uh, is, is River Life and the Uprising of Nature. Uh, both very, very provocative and, and interesting titles, and we greatly look forward to reading them. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll pass it over to you, Navida, uh, to speak today. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Toshif, for the lovely invitation. Thank you to the Institute of Islamic Studies, and thank you to the Center of South Asian Studies. It's such a pleasure to be able to uh, continue to have conversations in the midst of what is still a very horrible unfolding of the pandemic. And, uh, and so I really, I really appreciate the effort that you've put in to make this conversation possible. 
what I'm going to share today is really just a, a very slim chapter from the book Accounting for an Uncertain Future. The book grows out of five years of field work looking at the UN-led uh, climate negotiations, uh, the Conference of Parties, and uh, which I started to follow with the start of the Paris Agreement in 2015 and continue to follow to today. In the course of following and trying to figure out what, what on earth I'm doing at this conference, uh, which as you can imagine can be quite, um, you know, quite unpleasant experiences, but also have their own occasional uh, 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 surprises, I realized that it would be really interesting to actually think about what is Bangladesh doing within this very large space, right? It's a small country, as we know, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's not, um, it's not particularly independent or particularly flourishing, uh, although it is in some uh, metrics. But, you know, in terms of the global uh, South, uh, it has sort of a tenuous position in that category, within that category. So I wanted to try and figure out how do we understand its politics, right? What, uh, given that it is so dependent on depend, uh, development funds, et cetera, what does it mean for it to come to this conference and uh, and to actually negotiate it? So the book itself sort of introduces uh, uh, people to the process, and it's a very very open and invitational book, and written in very simple prose, as you'll hear uh, from my from my paper. Uh, and so it doesn't have a lot of heavy theory in it. It's got a lot of ethnography in it. What I'm hoping is that in our conversation, you'll push me and you'll ask me to think with you uh, around questions that I should, you know, be thinking further as a way to think beyond this project as well. Um, so, okay, so I'm just going to start reading and um, I have 35 minutes and I hope to be completed within that time. I'm just going to set the stopwatch so that I don't drone on. And hopefully you won't fall asleep. Hopefully you'll find the writing enough engaging that, uh, that you'll be here at the end. Okay, so the title of the chapter in the talk is What is Bangladesh? And that's in keeping with all the chapters in the book. It starts by asking, what is the Paris Agreement? And what's the Conference of Parties? So it's in that line. Uh, it's not to introduce all of Bangladesh to you in the next 35 minutes. Um, so let me just uh, get started. So the first, title, the first section is titled Leadership Within the COP Process. I had come to the COPs to study how Bangladesh fared within the climate negotiation process. I did not approach the delegates immediately, preferring to see how they presented themselves in public. Initially, I focused largely on Salim ul Haq, who is a very major figure, both nationally as well as internationally in this climate uh, space, and his team. I met and interviewed Bangladeshi activists. I met members of the Bangladeshi press. In addition, there were quite a number of prominent Bangladeshis entrenched in various UN agencies that were part of this process. And of course, there were the expatriate Bangladeshi youth who had come to the COPS for training or internship purposes. I thought that such a distribution of bodies was fairly standard until someone commented to me that Bangladesh seemed to be very well represented at the COPS. It tallied with the conception I had from prior work with UNHCR in Bangladesh that for educated Bangladeshis, such UN led processes provided important opportunities for employment, out migration, and upward mobility. At the same time, they engage these opportunities as nationals, that is proudly pronouncing their national identity and desire to upbuild Bangladesh's reputation and standing in the international sphere. So it came as some surprise to me to encounter two scientists within the Bangladeshi delegation who spoke very cynically about the process and Bangladeshi participation in it. Doctors Ainun Nishat and Atik Rahman, and I use, even though this isn't convention in anthropology to use people's actual names to protect their privacy, I do in this case because this is a public forum, these are public figures, and so, um, you know, they, uh, they get cited in lots of ways that are beyond their control as they are here. Um, they're both well-known scholars of the environment and climate in Bangladesh and abroad. And they sat with me during one of the 
International Institute for Environment and Development. I'm sorry, there are a lot of acronyms here. This is the UN after all. Their Development and Climate Days at COP23 in Bonn 2017 to recount that attending the COPs was a lark for some and an addiction for others, but that there was no further use for this process for Bangladesh. Bangladesh had its future tied up with the World Bank, India and China. And there was nothing it could do or would do to change its course in terms of sustainable development, much less carbon emission reduction. Its participation in this process was mere lip service. Dr. Nishat ventured to say that I was far gone in my addiction as well to the COPs, as evidenced by my returning to it year after year. When I asked Salim about Bangladesh's place within the COPs, he gave me consolation that although Bangladesh's fate may be tied, it was after all a small, poor, dependent country, it was admired for taking a leadership role within this process and for inspiring others. Encouraged by Salim's words, I sought to figure out what is meant for Bangladesh to take a leadership role within this process. Bangladesh within the wider climate context, that's the name of this next section. Before giving an account of what I learned about leadership by Bangladesh within the negotiations, it's important to place Bangladesh within the wider climate context to draw the impossible spaces it occupies, damned if it doesn't, damned if it does. I do not here recount the geographic features and economic statistics that make Bangladesh a climate vulnerable country. That profile, that information is available in spades from any number of websites. Instead, I present two ethnographic moments to do the job of illustrated, illustrating how often and easily the country is leached of complexity because of its perceived climate vulnerability, and how its inner dialogue about its public perception indicates considerable internal heterogeneity. At a conference uh, called Rethinking Race in the Anthropocene at the University of Oregon in Eugene in 2015, I distinctly remember a moment when a speaker, a Caucasian female climate scientist, started to recount the real world impacts of climate change. I listened with increasing dread as her talk turned to horror, uh, uh, to the horrors that lay ahead for vulnerable countries in the world. As she started to speak about Bangladesh, as I knew she would, she started to sob, saying over and over again, what have they done to deserve this? As the only person from Bangladesh at the conference, I wasn't surprised when heads pivoted to look at me as I sat slumped in my seat, skewered by the force of pity and liberal guilt. Thankfully, I got approving nods when I pointed out that Bangladesh was not just a victim, but a pretty messed up country in its own right, with a problematic government, inadequate infrastructure, no welfare provisions or safety nets for most of its 160 million people, and resource capture by its uh, elites. At the end, I wasn't exactly sure what I had achieved with my bravado, other than to assert that Bangladesh isn't free of politics. I fretted that my insistence only amplified the climate scientist's dirge for Bangladesh. With or without politics, it was done for, and the politics only made the inevitability worse. These politics were in ample view at the uh, Water Waves Weather Conference hosted by Brack University uh, back in 2011 when I had been carrying out field research in Bangladesh. The keynote speaker at the conference was none other than Dr. Nishat, the scientist at the COPS, who was at the time Vice Chancellor of Brack University. Not unlike the climate scientist, Dr. Nishat uh, sketched out the bits of climate science most relevant for Bangladesh. Correct the universal perception that its fate was to go underwater, he highlighted the fact that salinity in the soil was a much bigger and more major threat to the country's southern coast and those who lived there than inundation. He too sketched in stark terms what lay ahead for Bangladesh at every degree rise in global temperature. At four degrees rise, he predicted there would be no food security. Speaking clearly, but with considerable flourish, he was after all a lifelong educator and a public figure. Nishad said, we can no longer look to the past to anticipate the future. The future will have to be generated. Ending with the warning, we need to adapt or else we are going to suffer. Adaptation discourse was prominent in Bangladesh at that time. Uh, and after my exposure to the climate negotiations, I realized that this conference in Bangladesh came right after the Bali Action Plan had been adopted at to, uh, COP13 in 2007, which attempted to put adaptation on the same footing as mitigation. There was immediate pushback from the audience gathered to hear Nishad speak. Kushi Kabir, the formidable head of the activist organization Nijira Kuri, 
that sought to give landless people in the southern coast of Bangladesh property and legal rights, asked if it wasn't the case that Nishat's way of framing the problem of climate change made it entirely an engineering problem to be solved by technical means alone. Didn't the past of such wholesale engineering approaches to water management in Bangladesh have anything to teach us on how to anticipate and fight the future of climate change? Salim al Haq, who was also there in his capacity as a speaker, didn't so much disagree with Nishat as say what I had learned was a familiar uh, and very important refrain for him, which was it was not all bad and that the world would come to Bangladesh to learn from it. While Nishat foresaw a dire future, Salim anticipated many local and national efforts to rise to the occasion, while Kushi Kabir remained skeptical of the discourse of climate change itself. So now back to the climate negotiations. I finally approached the Bangladesh delegation in Bonn to focus on what had brought me to the COPs in the first place to see where, the, uh, where Bangladesh was positioned. I learned that most of the official delegates hailed from the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change. Over the years, I saw this change a bit. I saw the delegation joined by the members of the Department of Disaster Management and of the Planning Commission. Disaster management had become interested in climate change through its concern for how climate was to be brought within the rubric of disaster risk reduction principles, which was its bailiwick. And the Planning Commission was interested in the intersections of climate with the UN Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs. If there was anything to be learned, from this particular alphabet soup of ministries, principles, and goals was the extent to which the administration of Bangladesh hewed to international directives. By the time I introduced myself to the delegation, I had attended press conferences thrown by Bangladesh at the COPs over several meetings. They ranged from a comedy of errors with uh, ministerial figures speaking so unintelligibly about climate change that people in the audience walked out, to a thorough dissection of COP proceedings by a whole host of delegates who clearly knew the issues. At COP23 in Bonn, the Bangladeshi delegates were very organized, holding daily debriefing meetings within the COP premises. Others such as myself were allowed to attend, providing we did not interfere with the meeting. The delegation was largely men, although a few women were mixed in them, uh, of whom the men were very solicitous and protective. The meetings were a fine calibration of attentiveness to the nuances of hierarchy, with the additional secretary of the Ministry of Environment at the head of the table flanked by the joint secretaries, with the junior people, including deputy secretaries, senior assistant secretaries, and assistant secretaries, uh, subsequently arranged in order of decreasing importance. When higher ups joined the meeting, the order changed to accommodate them. But when the secretary, usually the head of the ministry joined them, all efforts at self-organization fell away with everyone thronging the secretary. Outsiders such as myself were either consigned to the outer circle of uh, chairs encircling the center table or to the back of the room. There was some expectation of hierarchy there as well with people beckoning me to change my location if I sat down presumptively. There was usually somebody hum hovering at the door to direct people to their status appropriate seat as they entered. The meeting commenced with everyone in the delegation asked to recount what they did that day and to relay notable developments in their analysis. If one was in a subordinate position, one only responded to queries without asking questions of one's own, and one's response began and ended with sir. From the discussions, it became clear that Bangladesh was here as much to attend side events, initiate contact and make bilateral deals through country boots as to participate in the negotiation. While careful attention to age, position and status mattered uh, among the government officials, such behavior was a bit more de generically deferential when it came to those members of the delegation who were from civil society. Science experts uh, such as Drs. Nishat and Rahman, uh, finance experts like Dr. Mizanur Rahman, uh, legal experts such as advocate Hafizul Islam who followed loss and damage, uh, or members of the government-run development organization PKSF that followed economic opportunities for the government at various side events and country boots. The PKSF was also an accredited entity with the Green Climate Fund created by the 2015 Paris Agreement. And in that capacity, it partnered with Bangladesh-based organizations to apply for funds from the 
uh, Green Climate Fund for climate related projects. So here I now turn to talking about Bangladesh in the actual COPs in the negotiations. Once, Bang uh, once the daily meetings ended and the delegation dispersed, all deferential behavior was shed and the delegates became part of the process. And so it was that I came to follow around Ziaul Haq, director of the Department of Environment within the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, and Mirza Shokat Ali, deputy director, who also had the additional qualifier international convention in brackets next to his title. The two men must have been in their late 30s, early 40s when I first met them, and had already discerned my age and position relative to them, as indicated by their calling me Appa or Big Sister the whole time. It also advocated, they expressed their evolving affection for me, whereas their boss, Dr. Nuru Kadir, who is located in the ministry and not the department, never referred to me as anything other than Madam, which served to keep me at arm's length. I thought initially to focus on the negotiations on adaptation, as it seemed a good point of entry for those interested in how the global south fared within the climate negotiations. From the perspective of LDCs, that is least developed countries, uh, such as Bangladesh, adaptation was development plus planning for climate impacts, as without the latter, progress on the development front would be continually scaled back. A big part of the relationship between such countries and the global north has historically been premised on receiving development funds in the form of outright grants or loans on favorable terms through intermediary organizations such as the IMF, the UN or the World Bank, or bilateral relations and multilateral agreements. The concern within the climate context was whether adaptation would add funds to development budgets or divert funds to climate change, while adding more checks on how development was to be undertaken in the country. A second issue I thought would be of, second, of interest to countries of the global south was finance. That is how industrialized countries were going to help least developed countries and other vulnerable countries by providing them the means to become more sustainable, thus avoiding the pitfalls of carbon intensive economies. The issues of capacity building, technology transfer and loss and damage uh, was also other means by which finance was to be um, handled. These constituted what is called the means of implementation of the Paris Agreement. Uh, just, to, uh, just to let you know, the expectation of such help of, uh, from the industrialized country was actually already explicitly mentioned in the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCCC, when it was crafted in 1992, and was considered an important means of undertaking wealth redistribution within the climate context. While a guiding principle in the convention, it was more concretely articulated in the Kyoto Protocol of uh, 2006 as defining the relations between Annex II countries, those countries with the most advanced economies, and non-Annex countries, those which fell into the most uh, vulnerable category. Uh, that the, two, uh, the Kyoto Protocol has been largely uh, scaled back, and in its place we have now the 2015 Paris Agreement. And interestingly, the Paris Agreement did not mention any hard and fast divisions among countries, nor did it explic explicitly dictate such relations among countries. Consequently, who exactly would be responsible for finance and all other means of implementation remained unclear and yet to be negotiated. To my surprise, uh, most of the LDCs, the least developed countries, even ones like Bangladesh, were not that interested on the issue of adaptation or of, on finance, right? Their focus was on the issue of mitigation. Mitigation has usually been seen as an issue for industrialized countries, historically most responsible for climate change, and best equipped to tackle the problem through curbing their carbon emissions or other mitigation strategies. Instead of leaving work on the stream up to developed and large developing countries, such as India and China, which had by now joined the ranks of developed countries through their emissions, Bangladesh was right in there in the negotiations, keen to forge the guidelines on how mitigation was to be directed. I have a separate chapter that talks about the negotiations on this issue and why Bangladesh is so invested in it, uh, but I don't go into it here. Here, I just explore the question of what does leadership mean for Bangladesh. So if you have questions on that, please, you know, do feel free to ask me during the question answer. 
I first spoke with Kadir, Dr. Kadir, about Bangladesh's priorities within the negotiation. This was my introduction to the country's strong neoliberal orientation. By this, I mean not only a positive orientation to the market economy, but also a sense that one was alone responsible for one state and eventual fate, which foreclosed analysis of the historical and structural causes of underdevelopment. Dr. Kadir felt that the UNFCCC was a genuine opportunity for a country like Bangladesh. This was because, in his words, Bangladesh was a process. It was uh, not Bangladesh, sorry. The UNFCCC was a process. It wasn't a top down, one size fit all development model such as the UNDP, end of quote. Through this process, relationships stood to be created. While Bangladesh was clearly in the development pathway, it needed to move away from pursuing development to seeking investments. Dr. Kadir thought that climate was an opportunity to address the investment gap. When I heard Dr. Kadir speak thus, I couldn't help but recall Kushi Kabir's cynical words to this effect back in Bangladesh, that Bangladesh was addicted to development funds and that climate was just another way to tap the developed world. However, Dr. Kadir was being a bit more nuanced than that. When he said that Bangladesh was a business opportunity, he meant that it was an opportunity for Bangladesh to do some quote unquote soul searching, to relook at quote, the products it had to offer, quote, the expertise it counted on, to ask itself, quote, what is my capacity? Quote, what do I need to achieve? And quote, what relationships will need, will help me to achieve these goals? Further on, he said, they, meaning the developed world, need us to do something. They're dependent on us. Although he didn't elaborate, I took him to mean that the developed world, developed world need the developing world to help fight climate change. And that this provided the opportunity for the developing world, including least developed countries, to really think about how they could do so and elicit the help of the developed to do so. Thus far, I had been thinking about sustainable development and poverty alleviation as the means by which developing countries were to contribute to fighting climate change. Adaptation was later added to this list as underdeveloped countries equivalent of mitigation by developed countries. Through Dr. Kadir's words, I was coming to understand that for Bangladesh after the Paris Agreement, that is after making all countries responsible for mitigation and not just developed countries, mitigation seemed like a new opportunity. It was opportunity to join the big guys, to think in their terms and to de develop relationships to enable climate action in their terms and by which to benefit following the lead of the negotiators, the name of the next section. While I mostly stumbled around in Paris, trying to wrap my head around the enormity of the enterprise called the COP, followed activists and various civil society organizations in Marrakesh in 2016. From 2017 onwards, I was listening in on as many negotiations relating to mitigation as I was able to access. In each subsequent uh, sessions of the COP, I shadowed Zia Bhai, introduced earlier, as an experienced negotiator in the Bangladesh delegation, as well as the lead negotiator on litig uh, mitigation for the least developed country bloc. Access to actual negotiations was spotty as one could only either enter with one of the few tickets provided to one's constituency, mine was the research uh, NGOs, or if the negotiations were open to all observers. However, I was able to be present with Zia Bhai at a number of meetings that were out of the general stream of things and that allowed me um, quite a bit of access to what was going on behind the scenes. Zia Bhai, as I mentioned earlier, was following mitigation, which is APA agenda item three. And that really had to do with operationalizing mitigation within the rule book, which is the way by which the Paris Agreement is going to be implemented uh, as soon as uh, you know, there, is, uh, uh, there is a meeting, a conference of parties. The last one was uh, postponed, the last one in Glasgow, and there's one uh, for, set for later this year. And so after this year, Paris Agreement is supposed to go into effect. He was doing this, he was following this issue on behalf of the LDC group, and he also went along with Salam Bubit, a young female lawyer within the delegation of Ethiopia. Um, he was also attending the meetings on behalf of the consultative group of experts, CBE, uh, CGE. 
of which he was a part and whose mandate was to help developing countries uh, with their communications to the UNF's triple C. Its time was up at COP24 and he along with others within it was seeking to extend its work plan for another eight years, but were facing resistance from the Trump led US delegation in Saudi Arabia, who wanted to scale back the UNF's triple C by pruning its constituted bodies. Ziabai bristled with energy as he walked into a meeting room, gripping his leather bag in his hand, finding his country placard and positioning himself next to Salam, listening intently, placing up his placard to make statements on behalf of the LDC group and then rushing out to go to another meeting somewhere else in the building. And as he walked, he explained parts of the process to me, his personal background, his experience with the process, and his reading of the ever-shifting landscape of politics, which was as much interpersonal and bilateral as impersonal and multilateral. And it was through these means that I came to have a deep appreciation for Bangladesh's close relationship with the EU. Uh, when Ziabhai tired of me following him around, peppering him with questions, he offered to have me follow Mirza Shokat Ali. To my surprise, I learned that Shokat Bhai, who I thought was mostly engaged with maintaining protocol within the meetings of the Bangladeshi delegation, was actually the second most influential delegate within the lot following APA agenda item four, which was on adaptation uh, on behalf of Bangladesh. Shokat Bhai carried his thin frame gingerly and seemed affected even appalled by the press of people and smells around him. He explained that he had developed a mysterious ailment in the past few years due to which he had lost a lot of weight and felt exhausted. Whereas once he and Zia had been uh, negotiators extraordinaire, he showed me pictures of himself from the UNFCC uh, C collection in which he would be he could be seen in better physical form in intense negotiation, Ziabai now carried the weight of negotiation. That was likely because activity on the issue of adaptation was almost at a standstill because it had been accepted within the pillars of climate action. Uh, Ziabai was very solicitous of Shokat Bhai, ensuring that he goes, got regular meals as purchasing food was always a struggle within the cops. Um, and taking him back to their lodgings in the late afternoon before returning to continue to negotiate till late at night. Zeb, I hope to bounce back soon. Perhaps by then, adaptation would once again be of central importance. While it was Ziabhai who wormed me into closed areas and explained the minutia of the process to me, it was Shokat Bhai who gave me insight into what uh, Bangladesh had to achieve. He agreed with Salim that given uh, that while Bangladesh's fate might be tied up at home, there was much to be achieved here for its self-representation through its actions at this for, uh, forum. He said with pride that Bangladesh's days of begging with the bull was over. It was graduating from LDC status to that of developing country by criteria laid down by the UN and the World Bank. He said that Bangladesh was here to provide both moral and economic leadership against developing countries. It would not wait to be told to mitigate and adapt. It would spring forth to do so with whatever resources it could muster. In so doing, it would demonstrate leadership and put to shame larger developing countries, such as China and India, that whined that developed countries should take the lead. Here he was, of course, referring to the insistence by G77 China and like-minded developing countries on the principles of common but differentiated responsibilities and equities, which is enshrined in the UNFCCC, but Bangladesh is among those countries that thinks that the time has passed for attending to these issues. Um, but he dismissed, Shokat Bhai dismissed the promise of finance capacity building and technology. Uh, why should developed countries give up what they had developed on their own for their citizens to unworthy others? Why didn't countries feel shame in demanding that these country, things be given free to them? Why couldn't they develop their own capacity? He pointed out that Bangladesh was already dealing in larger sums of monies than all the funds under the financial mechanisms within the UNFCCC combined. Bangladesh was not here to secure a line of funding from these entities, it was here to build relations to generate new economic opportunities for itself. Next section is titled Split Voice at the Press Conference. Growing up in Bangladesh, I've often cringed hearing the various ministers and prime ministers give passionate speeches at world forums begging for help. Hearing Shokat Bhai speak thus, I was thrilled by the firing speech coming out of such an enfeebled body at the image of Bangladesh ceasing to present itself as needy, dependent, and vulnerable. 
But the other voice of plaint was never too far behind. At a press brief by Bangladesh at COP21 in 2015, I heard it loud and clearly. Spokespersons for Bangladesh said in no uncertain terms that while Bangladesh used to be the land of floods, now it was the universal victim of climate change. End of quote. Adaptation was necessary for Bangladesh to survive, and for that they needed money. As Kasha Paproki has said, for Bangladesh, one of the most market-friendly uh, countries in the world, climate change adaptation was an economic opportunity. Jason Kearns has pointed out that despite the obvious temporal disjuncture, Bangladesh has managed to maintain the image of being a country on the edge of ruin due to climate change and simultaneously a country flush with economic opportunity. I was seeing these national trends play out at the COPs at the press conference. This split voice wasn't limited to the official delegates alone. It was there among the civil activists, uh, civil society activists as well. While mobilizing my help in a shop in Madrid, searching for souvenirs to take home to every member in his office back home in Cox's Bazaar, uh, the young Bijoy of Coastal Development Partnership said to me, Appa, you know Bangladesh, you know we need all the help we can get. That is why I come here to draw the people's attention to our efforts to make our people more resilient so they can fight the rising waters. Meanwhile, at the press conference mentioned above, Tanjir of ActionAid, one of the most forward thinking for NGOs in Bangladesh to have incorporated climate into every aspect of their projects, shook his head at the plan plaintive note struck by the spokesperson about Bangladesh's need for grant monies. He turned to me and said fiercely, that's not what we need, we need energy. In a hushed tone, he told me that, quote unquote, poverty was pollution and, quote, uh, growth was inevitable and proceeded to give me the distressing news of Japan's plans to set up coal fire plants and Russia's a nuclear plant in Bangladesh to shore up its energy production. Uh, when I asked him how that was helping climate change, he said, well, we first need a carbon footprint to be able to do mitigation. Some version of this position showed up again at an event by Bread for the World titled Towards a Just Energy Transition at COP23 in 2017. The Christian organization was very involved in bringing civil society members from developing and least developed countries to the COPs. At this event, I heard Masum, a civil society activist, give one of the fiat from Bangladesh, give one of the fiercest speeches I had heard given by a Bangladesh within this space. He said that the need was not for just energy transition, which assumed everyone was energy rich. It was just a matter of making a right choices for the most inclusive transition. In reality, energy had yet to come to large swathes of the population in Bangladesh who were energy impoverished. To thundering applause, Masum barked that people needed energy and energy uh, sovereignty before just transition. So let's return to the uh, leadership within the process. Given the heterogeneity and split voice within the Bangladeshi contingent, both official delegates and civil society representatives, what could Salim have meant by Bangladesh giving leadership within the process? The examples of this were readily available from those I met and have introduced in this chapter. Shropa Bhai told me that Bangladesh almost always took the lead amongst the least developed countries in terms of meeting reporting asks of the UNFCCC. He pointed to the fact that Bangladesh completed its National Adaptation Program of Action, NAPA, years before others had even figured out the template for the report. It had also completed the Bangladesh Climate Change Strategy and Action Plan. Both of these have been regularly updated. Furthermore, Bangladesh had been provided, uh, providing national communications to the UNFCCC and also submitted an intended nationally determined contribution ahead of the Paris Agreement, both of which were optional for least developed countries. Shawkut related how you would show up at the negotiations with these reports fresh off the press and run out of them within a day or two as fellow delegates sought to guide their own country-based reporting. Zeebhai represented not just Bangladesh, but the entire LDC group within the contact group meetings on NDC's nationally determined contributions within the negotiations leading up to the Paris rule book. He was also a member of CGE by which he provided guidance to countries on how to carry out their own national communications. Shokut rec recounted 
that in the early days of the introduction of the issue of loss and damage, on which I haven't spoken much here, but Bangladesh also takes quite a lot of leadership on this issue, which is a very uh, complicated issue. And I can speak on that as well in the question answer section. Uh, Bangladesh pushed not for liability or compensation, the two issues that made loss and damage anathema for developed countries, but rather for a settlement policy or agency by which the emergent issue of climate displaced refugees would be coordinated. I had heard this claim earlier during the press conference described above, in which one of the spokespersons said that it was disappointing that the issue of rehabilitation of climate induced uh, refugees had not been dealt with within the process. I had often heard Salim prophesize that climate refugees, increasingly inevitable in his eyes, were going to embody the failure of this process. However, despite uh, the contentiousness over this issue, Dr. Kader himself was involved in the Warsaw Mechanism on Loss and Damage, which was a clearing her house of sorts on information on how best to deal with climate change. And although it was a very unsatisfactory response to the demand for more attention to the fact of uh, climate change, uh, the fact that it was already wrecking havoc in people's lives, you know, he had an important role to play in that uh, mechanism. Bangladesh was there largely to be there. This process didn't hold much promise for the country per se, other than as a means by which to direct whatever little money there was to various country-based uh, projects. It was nevertheless an opportunity for the country to practice at being the first, taking initiative and being a good sport and playing along. It was a position that gave them pride, but also made them seem like pawns in the hands of those who gave them development funds, such as the EU. If there was anyone who was a clear unofficial leader, it was Selim. It was he who had forged the LDCs into a negotiating body, had secured them international advisors. He had put them into relationship with the African group of negotiators in the small island developing states to create the Climate Vulnerable Forum, which fashioned itself as the moral voice of those who were left out, both out of negotiations by the global north, but also by the global south, had made adaptation into a serious issue and now loss and damage and more lately capacity building. But he was the object of the same suspicion as directed at the Bangladeshi delegation by the activist, uh, activists within the process. As my effort is to restore some modicum of complexity and politics to Bangladesh and by exp extension to the Bangladeshi contingent and not to resort to thinking of them as either universal victims or um, hapless tools, I put forward the claim, and this is my final statement, that the Bangladeshi practice of self-possession while being dependent was an intriguing one, troubling in the national context and the domestic context, but interesting, curious, in the international one. And it made interesting their presence and participation within actual negotiations, such as the future of reporting on mitigation by both developed and developing countries as now dictated by the Paris Agreement. Thank you. Yeah, exactly 35. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Right on the right on the dot. Um, thank you so much, uh, Navida, for that really rich um, and very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. Um,